Hello. Um, I recently read uh, James Buchanan's book, The Doctrine of Justification, uh, from pages 155 until 179. And it was an overview of the Protestant differences on the doctrine of justification. So, let me just say what I've learned. In the 1500s, Martin Luther and John Calvin were the spearheads of the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther was in Germany, John Calvin was in France. Um, Martin Luther became known for his commentary on Romans and John Calvin for his Institutes of the Christian Religion. They were uh, men that were very smart men that had legal backgrounds and could articulate the God's message of salvation in Romans very clearly. Their views together came to be called what is called Reformed and uh, Reformation Soteriology. Their view of the justification by faith alone in Romans is that is that, it, that of imputation. Imputation is the interpretation of Scripture that says that Jesus not only died on the cross for our sins as a substitutionary atonement sacrifice for our sins, but that his sinless life in obedience to God's commandments was imputed or transferred to a Christian by faith. And so um, they, they, they taught that that's what justification means. It means to have be imputed Jesus' obedience to God's commandments to your account. Um, and I personally have no problem with that, that doctrine right there. But it seems that in time, this doctrine became perverted by people who had antinomian tendencies. Soon, soon enough, uh, a group called the Antinomians um, arose, and they taught that imputation is not only that Christ's sinless life is transferred to us by faith, but that, but that it, God is blinded from our sins in our current life. I don't see that being taught in Scripture. That God is blinded from our sins as the result of us having Christ's sinless life transferred to us. So the antinomians said, look, you know, Jesus, his righteousness is a cloak for me. Now I can live an ungodly life. <clears throat> and they, so they did not repent, they did not obey, they did not live, try to live imperfectly holy or anything. They didn't try sanctification out for chance. For a, for a, um, they had no order of salvation. They were confused about uh, the doctrines of salvation. They they believed in they were elected of God, um, just like the reformers. But they they didn't really know. You know, is it in faith? You know, all that matters is Christ's righteousness. That's the antinomian viewpoint. Um, they, you know, although they acknowledged that they had sin in their lives, they, they didn't really have a problem with that. They, they didn't continue to repent of their sins. They didn't confess their sins to one another and pray for one another that they may be healed from their sins. They did not repent and believe continuously throughout the course of their lives, growing in holiness and righteousness. None of that. In fact, they hated it. They even argued that to do that would be not trusting enough in the impu imputation of Christ's righteousness. So um, that is pretty silly in my opinion, and yet there are people today that believe in that. After this, there was a Socinian sect that rose. And uh, this was a legalistic group, actually. Um, they taught <coughs> that forgiveness of sins, or justification, is received by our repenting, our faith, and our obedience. 
and that it is not received by trusting in what Christ did on the cross. So Sinians taught that sin is merely a disease. It's not crime. It's not guilt. They taught that punishment ought to be viewed from a correctional viewpoint, not from a penalty viewpoint. <clears throat> and they taught that Jesus was just a man. They taught that Jesus died as a martyr. He did not die for the sins of the world. They were deists. They, they did not believe in the supernatural. They were skeptics. And they eventually led to Unitarian Universalism. That was the Socinians. Then there was the Arians. They denied that uh, there was a penal substitution on the cross. That, that Jesus appeased the wrath of God by dying on the cross for our sins. They denied that. And that Jesus dying on the cross, was they only accepted the moral influence view. That greater love has no man than this. That a man laid down his life for his friends. That's all they believed about the cross. That he was just merely showing us an example of self-sacrifice. And the Arians believed that justification has nothing to do with faith. Justification is a matter of repentance only. Silly. Then we came to the Quakers. Now, I don't really think Buchanan is right in attributing this to all of the Quakers because there have been different Quaker sects and groups over the past several hundred years. But um, he says that all of the Quakers believed that forgiveness of sins is acquired by feeling God's presence. That if you feel the presence of God within yourself working, then you know that you're saved. You know that you're forgiven of your sins. Um, justification is to the Quaker is growth in spiritual moral transformation, but it is not based on faith in penal substitution. Uh, so that they denied the atonement completely. And that everything was based on growing in spirituality. Strange. I don't know if that really applies to George Fox and the early Quakers, but this is what the man said. There was the Arminians. I'm an Arminian. I'm just going to say it out the bat. The Arminians. Now, he said that Jacob, Jacobus Arminius himself was at agreement with John Calvin on the subject of justification. In fact, he quotes John Cal uh, Arminius himself um, approving of uh, book three of Institutes of the Christian Religion in John Calvin's book. So, book three of Institutes of the Christian Religion by John Calvin, Jacob Arminius approved of it. He even said, I approve of it so much that I could sign it with my own signature. So, if you're an Arminian, you are at full liberty, according to Jacob Arminius, to believe in book three of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. And I think that that's a good judgment. Um, this contradicts what I've said in, in a previous video where I completely condemned the book. And, um, well, I, I've, I've loosened up a little bit more. I've become a little bit more reformed since then. I'm still a five-point Arminian. I still believe in the five articles of remonstrance. I'm still a Wesleyan Arminian. In fact, I agree with everything John Wesley said about salvation except for Christian perfection. So that means I agree with everything West Arminius said, and I agree with everything John Wesley said about Arminian and salvation except for the doctrine of Christian perfection preached by Wesley. So I just want to know that that's how thoroughly Arminian I am. And, but as an Arminian, this was interesting. That Arminius said, I agree with John Calvin so much on the doctrine of justification by faith alone that I could sign my own signature as if I had written Book 3 of Institutes of the Christian Religion. That's what Arminius said. He didn't approve the whole book, the whole entire volume. He just approved of Book 3. And I think that's a good thing, because there's some solid soteriology in, in that part of his book by uh, Calvin. Okay. But what is the major difference when it comes to an Arminian view of justification versus 
a Calvinist or a Reformed view. The major difference is this. Arminians preached that the word faith, when speaking of justification by faith, the word faith means in repentance, obedience to God, and good works included in the definition of faith. It's not just atonement. So, um, in other words, and I believe that. I know that's so hard because that sounds like you're being, you know, justification by works. It's not justification by works. It's justification by faith evidenced by good works. It's, um, but you say, but that's not justification by faith alone. I know. I know it's not. It's justification by lively faith alone, you see. So it's not, so the difference between an Arminian and a Calvinist is that they define the word faith differently. So if you can say to me, John, you're an Arminian. Do you believe in justification by faith alone? I would say, yes, I do. Uh, John, oh, John Calvin, you're a Calvinist. Do you believe in justification by faith alone? And you say, yes. But we have two completely different definitions of the word faith. My definition of the word faith is lively faith. As James chapter 2 says, faith without works is dead. And, and, and James chapter 2 also says... It is by works that a man is justified and not by faith alone. So what is he talking about? Not by a dead faith without works. So to me, the Bible is Arminian. The Bible defines the word faith as including not only a belief in the atonement of Christ on the cross, but automatically including in it an understanding and a, and a, and a, and a definition of of repentance, obedience to God, and good works. Lively faith. A faith that immediately, directly results in good works and obedience to God, so much so that it could be included in the very understanding of the word faith. That's the difference between the Arminian view of justification and, and uh, the Calvinist view, is that the word faith is the basically the biggest issue is that our word, as Arminians, we believe that faith, faith is not just evidenced by good works, faith is this vital, substantial, spiritual force that immediately produces good works. Whereas the Calvinist says faith is, faith is a doctrine. Faith is a doctrinal acceptance of penal substitution. I say it's more than that. You know, it, yes, I agree, but it's more than that. It immediately produces good works. Immediately. Repentance and obedience to God. So it's a lively faith from the very beginning. Okay. Um, it's important to note, however, that although Arminius was orthodox, he agreed with Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, Book 3, he was reformed you know, on the most important aspect, justification by faith alone. Um, Arminius was orthodox, but his immediate successors, um, Episcopus, Episcopius, Curselius, Limborch, and Hugo Grotius, all of those guys became Pelagians. That, or at least this is what Buchanan says in his book. Um, that their views of the five articles of remonstrance um, drifted away from a synergistic Holy Spirit-influenced, graced-influenced view and became Pelagian, self-natural ability viewpoint of the five articles of remonstrance. So um, Arminius started off good, but his followers became Pelagians. That's important to remember that. You can, you, you know, I, um... That was an interesting thing because in the in debates between Calvinists and Arminians, you always hear these Calvinists say, you Arminians are just Pelagians. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What about synergism, you know? And so this is probably the reason why this understanding is, is because the history of Arminianism has Pelagianism in it. But Arminius himself was not a Pelagian. He was a synergist. Okay, so, um, furthermore, 
is that the successors of Pel uh, Pelagius, I'm sorry, pff, the successors of Arminius, some of them also, these Pelagians, Arminians, uh, some of them actually ended up rejecting in penal substitution um, and, and only believed in moral influence. That's very bad. That's very much like the previous group I talked about, the uh, Arians. And so there were some heretical Arminians that followed Arminius, um, for sure. However, shortly after, not long after that, there were good Arminians that arose. Um, evangelical Arminians were disposed to doubt imputation doctrine because they saw it as being abused for antinomians. So um, it didn't they didn't reject imputation. It's just that they were incredibly skeptical of the doctrine of imputation because they, all they ever really saw it being used in context was an antinomian cheap grace. You know, I've got the righteousness of Christ, so I can just keep on living in sin type of stupid idea. And so the Arminians looked at that and they said, I don't know about that doctrine. However, they, they know it's in the Bible. They know the word imputed is in the Bible, so they can't, you know, reject it outright. So at least the Arminians did that. That, that Although that they, you know, they didn't reject the doctrine of imputation. It's just that they didn't emphasize it, that's all. Eventually, the Wesleyan Arminians would come around, and they would affirm, West, John Wesley would eventually affirm both the Reformed imputation as well as the Catholic implantation. That um, justification by faith alone yields the fruit of imputation. Okay. Uh, yields the fruit of, you know, we, we, when we believe in Jesus Christ, and we repent of our sins, his righteous, sinful li sin sinless life is applied to our sinful life. And not only that, and the Catholic view is accepted by John Wesley and the Methodists, that, that his righteousness comes into us supernaturally to develop a righteousness that we actually personally experience. And so I think John Wesley was right on by saying that. Okay, there was a group that was called the New Methodists, and they actually predated John Wesley and the Methodists. I wonder if they got their name from them. But uh, this is in the 1600s in France, in the Calvinistic French Protestant Church, John Piscator and Moses Amraldius were Arminians that appeared in the Calvinistic French Protestant Church, and but they denied, they were heretics, they rejected the imputed imputation, they rejected Christ's imputed obedience to God. They rejected it completely. That is wrong. I disagree with that. Um, however, this left open a door, quote, this left, left a door open for the introduction of his own personal obedience as the only ground of his future hope after he has obtained the remission of his past sins. Now, I believe that is taught in Scripture clearly, that Christians, their salvation depends not only on their faith, not only on their repentance, but on their personal obedience to God after they've been forgiven of their past sins. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, is nobody, nobody's perfectly obedient to God, so we have to bear that in mind. It's not based on our perfect obedience to God, but it's based on an imperfect obedience to God. Now, this was taught by the New Methodists, the Neonomians, and, the, the, um, and by the Methodists. These were different, uh, these were Arminians that arose in um, France and in England. And I agree with these guys. Now, uh, granted, from a Lutheran and from a Reformed viewpoint, this is heresy. I understand, but I'm willing to accept the brand of heresy from the Lutherans and the Calvinists, if that's what they want to call me. But um, I believe this is what the Word of God teaches. And I also want to say this. 
I have more in common with the Catholic by saying I believe in this. Now, <clears throat> as an Arminian, the New Methodists, this is interesting, Arminianism of Holland, Jacob Arminius Remonstrance, and the New Methodism of France, um, Moses Samraldius, John Piscator, these guys came together in a, in a collective influence and their teachings spread to England in the 1600s and 1700s and influenced the Church of England divines, the Anglican preachers, and the Puritan preachers. Okay, so there was a mixture of the Arminianism from these other countries as well as the Calvinism coming into England. And there were two Arminian preachers that became well known. John Goodwin, who died in 1665, and Richard Baxter, who died in 1691. Both of these men were godly, holy, righteous Arminian Puritan preachers. And they had a heavy influence theologically on John Wesley, who died in 1791, 100 years after the death of Richard Baxter. John Wesley founded the Methodist Church. And um, what these men had in common was Arminianism and, and the teaching of Neonomianism. However, none of them rejected imputation. They all affirmed imputation. They believed in imputation. But they believed that Christians are obligated to obey all of the commandments of God imperfectly growing as time goes on and that this plays a role in their salvation I agree with this I agree with this Luther and Calvin would not agree with this they would say that this is Catholic teaching call it what you want call it Catholic call it heresy I think this is what scripture teaches and um, in addition to that, I think that um, it's produced powerful revivals. Look at the life of Richard Baxter and his ministry at Kinderminster. Revival broke out. Look at the life of John Wesley. Revival broke out. Now, that's true. The Calvinists have had their revivals too. Jonathan Edwards, jo George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon. But look. And not only that, John Wesley had miracles happening when he was preaching. Can that the same be said of others? I just want to say that I think that the Holy Spirit has bear witness with me that the Neonomian teaching, as long as it doesn't reject imputation, is the Word of God. That John Goodwood, Richard Baxter, and John Wesley were prophets of God. Real evangelistic men. Now, after this, neonomianism came up, and this was a different kind than the one I was talking about. They believed in imperfect obedience to God, and that um, justification depended not only on faith, but on personal obedience to the Word of God. And um, this is a form of Arminianism, but they rejected imputation again and it, as an overreaction of the antinomian cheap grace guys. John Wesley was fully aware of all these things, and so by the time of the Methodists, he said, look, we don't have to reject the doctrine of imputation in order to be Arminians. We can accept it, we should accept it, it's scriptural, but let's just realize that we need to balance out our understanding of imputation with implantation. That it's not only that Christ's sinless, righteous life has been implanted, imputed to our account book in heaven, but that His Holy Spirit has come into us to transform our lives through implantation. Thank you very much. And so these are the doctrines of justification as taught by various Protestant groups. And um, I am therefore happy to be a follower of Wesley and Baxter and Goodwin and to be an Arminian. And, uh, and so just so you know, However, I would just as well have fellowship with a Calvinist who is godly than with an Arminian who is ungodly. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Thank you very much.